Welcome to NeuroNoodle's Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast featuring our neuropsychologists, Dr. Laura Jansen, Dr. Skip Wren, and neurofeedback legend, Jay Gunkelman. Our goal is to spread the word of the objective data you can receive from a brain map and the positive results of training with neurofeedback. This is an all-star cast that are more than happy to share their knowledge with you. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You get to see some of the behind the scenes action. It really helps to get the word out. If they can't hear us, we can't help them. If you're not a subscriber, visit neuronoodle.com to sign up for our newsletter. My name is Pete, and today we have on the show Dr. Patrick Porter, founder and CEO of BrainTap Technologies. Dr. Patrick, thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, it's great to be here and great to meet all of you. Now, you're, you're also an author. You have three books out there. You want to give a quick plug before we forget on the three books? Sure. I've written nine books, actually, so I'm not sure. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I saw three yeah. for sale. Yeah. yeah. The, the main book is uh, for the brain I, I wrote back in the 90s called Awaken the Genius when we got into how do we improve people. I was, I was blessed to be the son of an alcoholic, so I kind of wrote about my history and how he got us to use there was no neural feedback back then. We used biofeedback, and those on the call probably know about GSR machines and things of that nature. So that was my that was my first introduction before we had neural feedback, which raised the bar, of course. And so, and then, uh, so that's all a book about how you can improve your brain function and behind the scenes, really accelerated learning and how that works. Number uh, the second book we'll talk about today is one we call it Your Flourishing Brain, and what we did is we took. Uh, what people, what the client needs to know in our offices, because we have 2,300 clinics out there using our technology, we thought, how can we simplify this, taking it from neuroscience to everyday communication? So we wrote a book for the client that basically tells them that they have a brilliant brain. We need to activate it, get it working. It's, it's not their fault. Nobody trained them to use their brain. <laughs> so we need to just teach them some of the little step-by-step -step processes to do it. You know, and we believe that uh, we're now in the age of brain fitness. Instead, you know, when you think about uh, everybody wants to talk about meditation, well, we want to talk about activation. We want to talk about using that power. And then the third book we'll talk about today is Thrive and Overdrive, which uh, everyone is, they don't understand why their brain is dysregulated. Well, it starts number one with, um, stress. And that starts because of the number two, which is sleeping issues. So then in our lifestyles that we all live in this digital lifestyle, which I think is amazing is the best time to be on earth, but it also has its downside. If you're abusing it and not balancing your brain and doing the things you need to, to exercise the brain and keep it balanced. So most of my books are all about brain fitness, how, how we can activate the brain about my story or clinical experiences I've had with my clients. And then tell us about BrainTap. BrainTap started uh, with my, my excitement about biofeedback. Of course, we use all respiration, breathing techniques, and uh, using uh, hand temperature, different things like that. And then it just kind of evolved. And I fell into working with a company called Light and Sound Research out of um, Phoenix, Arizona. And by doing that, we were creating a clinical grade uh, neurofeedback, biofeedback kind of mechanism. They called it the cells at the time, a sensory input learning system, which could measure and evaluate a person's you know, physiology. And then we could get it to do things just like we're all doing with, with neurofeedback or biofeedback, but it was very crude. It was, uh, it was actually before the, uh, a lot of the different technologies. But in doing that, we kind of stumbled across the effects of flickering light or uh, what we call frequency following response and what would happen. So we combined the sciences at that time of light and sound using sound to trigger this effect. And then when LEDs came out, we could mimic the effect of uh, frequencies like a candle frequency of 10 Hertz frequency or the ocean of 10 Hertz or the mountains. So we started playing around with frequency response with light and sound. And when we did that, we invented the first portable light and sound machine. Since then, we've developed over 15 of them. We're actually in our 16th iteration right now, where we integrate more with low-level light therapy to give it, because what we found is the brain needs energy to do all this information, to do all this exercise, and it comes in the form of ATP. So we have to deliver the energy so the brain can do the work. If the brain doesn't have the energy, it can't do the work, and then basically it just continues to atrophy. So what we did is we created it first in an app, 
you can get it on your phone because you can do this all with sound. But what we found was when we, you can upgrade that if you wanted to by using a headset. And that's what we created with BrainCap was to, and that was more for our clinicians at first. And then four years ago, we started opening it up to sell my technology because some other people were, if you lack of a better word, uh, borrowing the technology. The, uh, uh, and so we decided to go out there ourselves and show them what the real deal is because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of fraudulent programmers out there that basically think it's like a Christmas tree light. They think it's just flashing lights and that's couldn't be further from the truth, but they don't know the science. So what we have the brain tap and right now we're very fortunate. We're, we have 12 peer one tier one universities working with us doing research all the time. We have 14 studies going on right at this moment. We're, we're revolutionizing the, the biggest one I think to meet, to meet here is that, in Brazil, we're actually, the government of Brazil is spending $200,000 of their own money to prove brain tap as a, as a digital drug because we've upregulated the 54 neurotransmitters and we can prove that with science. So they're, we're hoping that the Invisa is what it's called there. Once we get the approval of Invisa, we'll get the approval here of the FDA to actually call it a digital drug because these these technologies that we're talking about change brain chemistry so we're trying to prove that so it's not just metaphysical if you will a lot of people think oh this is just uh magic nothing's really happening but science is now showing and, and neurofeedback is is really the reason we can now prove all this so that's why oh, we're here oh i'm stealing that digital drug that's huge your uh, routine you start out in the morning with a routine and at lunchtime, you want to talk about that and I'll let the doctors and Jay take over. But my, because we do a lot of light sound and vibration, of course we do that. My, my morning routine is more than this, but the, in this relationship uh, of neurofeedback, what I typically do is I get up and I do my breathing work uh, to regulate my parasympathetic and sympathetic system to engage it. And usually I use like a four to four, eight breathing technique or something like that. That's my favorite. And just to uh, upregulate my parasympathetics and engage my brain. And then I use a session, we call it digital coffee because we have sessions that actually upregulate the SMR uh, brainwave. So for cognition and uh, things of that nature. And what we showed is if uh, the reason I use it is we show 23% improvement in alpha activity over a six week period. And then six months later after the washout, it remained. So that's phenomenal. And we did that with autistic children, which is even more phenomenal because autistic children can't use regular mainstream neurofeedback uh, the way that the tr classical way that we do it. So I wake up with that because I want to wake up my brain without coffee. So we call it digital coffee. Now, we believe in the electrical system more than we believe in the biological system. So as we do those things, so Skip, if you have a question before we go on, let's, why don't we handle that? Oh, shoot, I did, thanks. Um, that actually works. It doesn't work usually. We're gonna maybe have you on more often. Wait, first question's kind of silly. And are you out of New Bern, North Carolina? Yeah, we, we have offices in New Bern, San Francisco and in Durham, North Carolina, but I'm out of okay. New Bern. Okay, you don't sound like it, but I believe you. Nope. No, nope, I've, I've lived all over the country, I, but I had, okay. my, I had a franchise that uh, we actually had 108 locations. I'm originally from Michigan, but spent most of my time in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And then when okay. I sold that company, of course, I couldn't live there anymore. So, <laughs> so I'm now living right. with my grandkids, which is a lot more fun than, than living uh, far away from them. My dad's dad was based at Cherry Point. So I know New Bern, you know, through, oh, yeah. through family history yeah. stuff. Uh, yeah, I but I was hoping if, if it's not too much of a step back, uh, if you could talk a little bit about epigenetics, and, and I think that's obviously a wide open you know, question for you, but it, it seems behind a lot of I innovations, and in, in at least philosophically, that, hey, there's all this opportunity here to change the way our bodies work and respond to their environment. And I don't know if folks are totally aware of it. Maybe they are, and it's, it's redundant. But do you mind? Do you mind just touching on epigenetics and what that is? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. First of all, we're all sharing something called biophotons right now. You know, our body is communicating at a molecular level through light. We're not, it's not a metaphysical concept anymore. Science has proved that we are light beings and that there's information. We're more information than we are solid. So what we also know when they map the genome, in, in 2003, they came out and celebrated, oh yeah, we mapped the genome. We're all excited. But then you read it, it's 1%. 
So I don't know about you, but when I graduated college, I had to answer more than 1% of the questions, you know, so, but they're all excited. The reason that they couldn't map those other 99%, it's not junk DNA, like they say, that is who we are. Every 40 seconds, we have a biophotaic exchange of, on, on a molecular level of every one of our genetic markers. So every 40 seconds, we are a different person through light. And so, and that goes through the dura, you know, the, the fascia in the body. So we know the nervous system because we all work with that every day, but there's another level of communication in the body that, that upregulates uh, the vagus nerve, you know, gets us into parasympathetics is, you know, that's what we want to do. So we also know because of people like Bruce Lipton and Biology Belief, which is one of my favorite books, and Bruce is a friend of mine. Uh, who teaches with me at Quantum University. He's kind of an adjunct professor, but he comes and does some lectures for us. And he showed that 2,300 gene expressions can be altered through this kind of relaxation process. So when, you're, when you think about turning on and off who you are, we know that it's affected by our thoughts. Our thoughts are the biggest determiner because we all know about the default mode network. Uh, how do we change that? Well, it's changed by our subconscious. Only 5% of our reality is controlled by our conscious mind. So the 95% of our reality that's controlled by our subconscious, that's why we have to do all this brain training. Because when we're busy doing what we're doing, our brain's busy doing what it's doing. And it's doing it at a cellular level, not at a, not at a conscious level, like, oh, should I make this decision or not? It has to do it. And it operates in another time, or if you want to call it, than we do. Because every 40 seconds, every cell, every genetic marker is adapting. We're, we're very adaptive. There's only a small amount of us that's fixed in space and time. The other thing about uh, that I like to inform people about epigenetics is that they've now shown that 20% of your genetics, you really can't change, right? It's mom, dad. I mean, I wish I had a dad or mom, however that worked. I didn't get my hair, you know? So, you know, I wish I could just turn on that gene and I get my hair that I had in high school, right? And, and I would comb it more often than I did then. You know, things like this, you know, but we can't do that. But there's 80% of our gene expression and it is an expression. It's not a reality because it expresses itself. We could, with negative thinking, they know that we turn on the genetic presuppositions of the most negative forms of ourself. If we're optimistic, positive, we live in a, in, in a high, what I call thriving state, which instead of, for my clients, I don't say parasympathetic and sympathetic because they don't understand that. I'll say you're either in a, a thriving state or you're in a survivor state, you know, and we want to, we want to unlock the thriving brain and unplug that survivor brain. But when whatever brain you're in right now, that's the nervous system, because 70% of your nervous system exists between your ears. I usually tell people you're only six inches away from changing your life. We just need to get that brain working for you. Then the genetic markers will all line up and an incredible force of power will work in the direction of your goals physiologically. Because if you're not physiologically ready, you're not psychologically ready. Now, some people can psychologically through their just will they can do things, but if we get our biology and our psychology working together, we become a powerful force for change. And with the epigenetic feature, we can, we literally can change ourselves by changing our thoughts. And it's not a metaphysical concept anymore. This is all proven in science. So in that, and that's really where when people start settling down, learning breathing techniques, learning how to visualize, let's say, learning how to calm down the system. And instead of being in the storm and thinking they're a part of it, you know, move to the center of the storm and kind of viewing it from a distance, they can make better decisions. And that turns on those genetic markers. So in my case, when I say I was blessed to be the son of an alcoholic, obviously I have the genetic markers where I could turn those on. I know how to do that. I just go to the bar, you know, and I do things that I see alcoholics do, you know, but if I want to be successful, I'll go find people that are successful and I'll start using my mirror neurons to turn those genetic markers on because that's part of it too. You know, when you, we know that through these biophotaic exchanges that if I'm in your right now, the reason you see me is I'm exchanging photons with you, even though it's through a digital means. But if we were together, we would actually be sharing them in a very physical, real way. We would know that's why you see friends or family members that get together, they start their same languages, they start their home behaviors, they start acting the same. It's because there is they're sharing in the same, if you will, consciousness in that in that environment.
that's happening. It's changing. It's turning on and off those gene expressions. <clears throat> so I don't that's, know where you want to go. From there. Well, I, I had a follow up, and of course, leave it open to other folks too. But so then that, for me at least, begs the question: So how how, how do you utilize everything that you just referred to? That's you know, air quotes, right? Available to us when folks come to see you. How do you turn that into what you do? Yeah. Well, part, part of it is that I believe that we all have an inherent intelligence, this innate intelligence, physically, mentally, emotionally, even spiritually. If we, if we tune into our best self, let's say, whatever that is. Now, of course, we've all been trained by mothers, brothers, teachers, preachers. All those people have told us what to think and what to do. So what I tell people is whatever's working for you, you want to focus on that, intensify it in your thinking, you know, and we use a lot of, of what might be called some modality work because we're going to change the images and pictures and remember the positive things that happen. The, most of our issues come because we're focusing on all the wrong things. Like if you're focusing on the problem, the subconscious says, you must like that. You're spending a lot of time with it so I can make it worse, you know, because that's what you're focusing on. It doesn't know it's bad or good. It doesn't have reasoning power like that. The, the subconscious, they, like they say, is it, it makes a good a servant, but a terrible master. So when, when people come to see me, I go, you've trained, you've trained yourself to do these things. Every behavior is learned. There's not one behavior that people have that hasn't been learned, whether it was through genetic transmission, you know, like we got mom and dad's genetics, or, or we've learned it from our environment, or it's basically part of our whatever's going on in the world. So what I say is when you find out what's not working and you're honest with yourself, so it's kind of almost like going through the steps of AA, you know, you've got to be honest, you know, so the biggest thing that I find is that people think they oversimplify things like, Oh, is that all I have to do? No change takes work. It can be fun. It can be easy, but you have to do the work. You know, it's, it's like I, I tell employees at times or team members, I'll say you do the work, then you get paid. A lot of people out there think, I'm, I just want to get paid. I don't want to do the work. I don't want to practice this stuff. You know, what are you talking about? What do you mean it's going to take me? I got to do this the rest of my life. Well, like reducing stress, for instance, I tell people, they go, is, is this something I got to do forever? I go, only if you want to get rid of stress. I mean, if you can show me a planet where there's no stress, I'm, I'm on board. Let's go there. You know, but it's not about, uh, so what, what I typically tell my, my clients and people I'm working with is that, in the, they say that you shouldn't pray to God to eliminate your stresses, but should give you the energy and the resources to handle them. And he, and we do have those. We have that intelligence. We have that capacity because if, if someone else is doing it, we can learn to do it and maybe even do it better than they're doing, but we have to model that behavior and we have to first believe it's possible. So Jay, you have a question? Uh, I think Jay's letting us know he just needs to step away for a bit. Okay. I, I have a question. So I just kind of piggyback on what uh, Skip is uh, asking. Um, what, what does a session look like? What, what uh, you know, they, they it, it, I guess my er, uh, first question, though, is how do they find you? Like, how do you um, get folks to come see you? What's your strategy for getting them in? And um, what does a, a session or two look like? Okay. Well, our strategy is um, typically we, we let our successful clients tell stories. And, and nowadays it's different than it was in the past. We do this through social media now and through other means. They tell about their experiences and that brings people to us. Uh, Brain tap in general, we do this because we work with clinics that already have clients. So it's not like they're, they're not coming to see brain tap. I mean, nobody knows it exists. It's like, uh, I mean, hopefully we're changing that, but it's like they're coming because they have an issue. Like uh, usually it's insomnia, or maybe they're dealing with a weight issue, maybe it's a learning issue, something like that, that they're coming in for, they know it's a brain issue. And then what a session looks like is we first, we use a piece of equipment that we had designed in Russia, it's a, it's an HRB, but it's, it's really more than that. It measures nine points of your biology. And it's the one we use when the NIH published my um, last um, research that I did last May, we, we took 100 people and we did a, a measurement pre and post before they did a brain tap session and after, and it measures their biological markers. And we had a 23% improvement in biological function. So first we show them that there's a problem, you know, and then 
<clears throat> depending upon if we're, we might even use like the Wabi, which is another piece of equipment that measures brain states. We do a lot of work with Wabi. And depending upon what they're coming in for, there's that's the diagnosis piece. So we got to say, okay, here's what's going on with your brain. And then we say, here's what we think we can do. And then we show them, we actually have them experience it. And then we show them afterwards. So we do a pre and post. In general, uh, the average improvement in neurological function from just one 20 minute session with brain tap is a 33% improvement overall in neurological function. It has a washout period of about 72 hours. So just doing it once isn't gonna like move the needle forever. They might have a good experience, but then what we do is we say, because the nervous system wants to reset back to whatever that client's neurological norm is, we tell them we need to see you three times a week. And the three times a week, and now we're, while they're at home, we also have homework for them to do. So we give them the app to use at home. Now, they don't have the light and sound equipment at home. They can buy that, of course, for home use. But we have them do the audio part at home. Because to really train the brain, we need to change it in the morning. We need to wake the brain up. What we found in our research is most people's dysregulation starts first thing in the morning. They wake up and they have high delta. In fact, we've, in our, we've probably scanned 30,000 brains in the last 10 years, and we found that over 60% of the people have more than 70% delta during the day. Now, what that means is they have a lot of inflammation, maybe they have traumatic brain injuries. Now, these are all people that are coming to us. This isn't the normal population. This is the clinical population, right? So they have issues. The biggest issue is inflammation in the body, in, in the brain. So we have to bring down that inflammation. So then what we, what we show them is because we can measure that, we can show them over time how their therapy is working. We usually keep them in therapy until they're at 80% neurological function. Now, if we're using some neurofeedback with that, we typically use our neurofeedback training, whether we might even use something as simple as Muse, which is, you know, just a game, you know, it's not, it's not as sophisticated as others, but it gives them the capacity to know that they can control their brain waves. You know, but if we're using like our neuro infinity device where we have all the different neuro games, they might play those because we want to show them uh, during the client session. Let's say that we do their brain scan and we find out that they're low in theta, which is most every adult you would see. <laughs> That's why they don't produce enough GABA and they can't sleep. You know, so uh, when you're gonna, when you have high theta, you're going to be telling your gut to produce more GABA. You're not going to have any problems sleeping. You're going to have great dreams those kind of things. So what we show them, we say, hey, here's what's going on. So we're going to do some theta training with them. Now, they're going to do the theta training at home with audio only. In the clinic, they're going to be doing that with the light and sound. And it's really as simple as coming in and um, usually I'm at, my, I'm at my office studio. Now at my home studio, I have a, a, one of the headsets. But they just put it on, close their eyes, and really the, the brain learns through the frequency following response. And we will at times actually measure that at the same time. We'll use the neuroinfinity to do real time measurement to show them here's how your brain is, you know, on the brain tap. We only have to do that once or twice because after that, they just want the benefits. They don't really need to know what's going on. But we do have those people, those that there's another group of people, especially when it comes to learning and things of that nature, they want to do more neurofeedback training. So we include that into the program. But usually we sell purchase prices like. Uh, let's say they're going to come in for three months, three times a week. That's that's usually our standard of care. That's like the baseline package. And I don't know, maybe we're not that good, but I find that it takes, it does take about anywhere between six to 10 weeks to make a real change to the brain, even though you might get a little change here. Uh, but in order to really affect the brain, and then what we found is it takes two years of training, but they can't afford two years of training with me. So we send them home with the headset and then they come in usually once a month for a checkup to, so we can tell them, Hey, you're still on the way. You're still doing it, but you can only get so much change. I mean, they're going to get the biggest change during the first 10 weeks, but after that, it's really incremental and they can do a lot of that training at home. So we have uh, for the, let's say they have dementia or Alzheimer's, we're going to have them do, we're going to have them take the headset at home. We're also going to have them do some uh, low level light therapy at home. We have a, a headset that goes on the head that we're actually building that into the brain tap now because the research shows if we can get more energy to the brain, we can get better change. You know, if they don't have the, they're only going to do the work until the energy has gone. And then once the energy is gone, the brain's going to fatigue. And most of our clients don't know 
well, we know that the brain uses the massive amount of energy resources in the body. And even though they think they're just sitting there, maybe watching sailboats or watching a movie that, that blurs out when they get tired, they don't realize they're using a lot, a lot of energy. So we have to also inform them about what foods are good for the brain and things of that nature. So how, how receptive are folks? Oh, we do. We we're doing phenomenal. I mean, our doctors, one of the, with Wabi, I saw you nodding your head. We, we got involved with Wabi because they contacted us. The doctors that were doing TBI training or traumatic brain injury training with the brain tap, because Wabi records everything in the cloud. They know the doctors and what they're doing and the results they're getting. They contacted us and said, your doctors are getting 130% more faster improvement than other doctors. What are they doing? And we said, well, we're feeding the brain the energy it needs to make the changes the neurological doctors are doing. And that's why groups like um, the IAFNR, which is one of the big groups that gave me a Lifetime Achievement Award, which I don't think I'm old enough for that yet, but I'll take it. The, uh, it's because we're their at-home program. We can't, we can't replace the doctors in the office. We can't replace neurofeedback and all those kind of things you're doing. What we can do is we can give the doctor a way to continue the care at home and also after they do all that neurological training, like if we have somebody doing neurofeedback here, if they're gonna do alpha training, theta training, or SMR training or whatever it is, we're gonna have them do brain tap afterwards because we just, it's just like exercising the body. After you do done with physical exercise, we now know the best thing you can do for your physical body after exercise is rest and recovery. The same thing's true with the brain. So we provide the rest and recovery for the brain piece that helps them to get the, the best results possible for them. Dr. 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 Laura, I I did wavy, didn't I? Yeah, we. There's a neurologist uh, in the area who uh, we've um, uh, connected with, and uh, Pete. Uh, he can tell the story of, of using the wavy, but uh, my, my memory of it—that's the only experience I have with the wavy—is that it's um, heavily focused on event-related uh, potentials. Uh, so he, the the tasks are. Um, like trails and things like that, but but uh, the measurements are about how quick or how how fast are, uh, is the processing speed and how fast are you responding and in those increments of time can predict um, adaptation and you're trying to train adaptation. Is is that the short story? Yeah. It, well, we have all these potentials, right? But they know uh, the one that they measure mostly is the P three hundred because you can't fake that. I mean. Heart rate variability, a lot of people, we use it a lot, but you can fake that out. I mean, once you learn how to do breathing techniques, you can, you can fake out any, uh, it's just like GSR machines. Once you get good at it, you can pass any polygraph, you know, things like that. You know, I used to have to work with people who were trying to get into the military or anything that did things you know, when they were younger, they didn't want to have an adverse response to, and you can, you can train the nervous system, but you can't train the P300. So what they're, so what it does is if you get a baseline, uh, you can't use it after the injury because that'll be the baseline. But if you can get it before the person's injured, like their, their current operating state and that evoke potential is what they call it. And there's a lot of research about that. And you can't really train evoke potential. It has to heal. You know, so that's that's where all the lasers come in and the light, low level light therapy and all that. You have to heal that part of the body. You can't train your you can't train your P three hundred back. You, but once the energy is there, you can you can improve upon your response time. But we're basically born with a certain brain. It's kind of like in in track. When I used to coach track, I could I would have people do this exercise. It would tell me if they were going to be a sprinter or a distance runner by their gait. So you can't improve that. It's like, this is what it is. So you could, and the, the brains are the same way. So we do have a P300 that, and it's a, it's not good for neural feedback, but it's good for brain state, like doing brain maps, you know, showing, well, how much voltage you have in your alpha, you know, because we find in dementia or is, are the hemispheres out of balance? Because as you probably know, most issues out there, especially with fear, anxiety, and depression are really hemispheric imbalances, dysregulation. Once we get those regulated, and, the, and what I tell my clients, I go, you know, imagine you, everybody thinks their memories are just there. Like you go back to a filing cabinet and they're there, right? We know it could be eight or more places in the brain that light up when you think of a memory. So if, if, that, if the hemispheres aren't communicating appropriately, even milliseconds are stressful to the brain. So when the information doesn't go, the brain goes, well, it's not there, write it off. 
you know, because we're rendering 80% of our reality anyway, you know, from memory, life happens too fast to have ac accurate information. We're assuming and so what we have to do is we have to train people to slow down that process and get those hemispheres to work together. And it's a function of nature. I mean, our body knows how to do it. We just have to get out of that dysregulated state long enough to retrain the brain to go back to its normal state. And that's what the, these kind of tools do. Dr. Porter, we do this podcast to help get the word out. And you were on the Joe Rogan podcast. How did the, tell? Please tell us more. How did you get on? What did you talk about? I I just looked on the notes. I'm like, wait a minute. Actually, it wasn't. I wasn't please. on the Joe Rogan show yet. He does have a brain tap, but uh, it was one of our fighters because we do a lot of work with recovery. And uh, yeah. one of the sports that I used to like, I, I still watch. We still have a lot of athletes. I shouldn't say that, but. Uh, we shouldn't really be boxing or doing UFC fighting. You know, once you once you get into the brain, you're going, "What are these people doing? This is crazy." You're you're the our well, most powerful it's, asset. So it's sort of like a uh, dentist giving out popcorn. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so we have uh, we have one of our fighters that got on there, and Joe Rogan asked him what was he doing for his mental uh, fortitude, and then he brought up brain tap, and then Joe Rogan spent five minutes talking about brain tap and just showing the graphics, basically. Uh, we, of course, in business, you're talking earlier, how do you get people when Joe Rogan said that we actually had about a 3000% spike in our activity on our website. You could just tell right away. So he's somebody that basically has some influence, you know, when you start talking about it and he was showing our website on the show and talking about it and basically gave us a five minute infomercial <laughs> on his show. And the fighter was really cool because the fighter used one of our visualizations during his, uh, his brain tap session, which was step into the spotlight. And he told him, he said, I visualized before the fight. I, he did the session before the fight and it said, step into the spotlight. He said, I saw myself knocking him out at 54 seconds. And then he said, he, he knocked him out at 54 seconds. So, I mean, we, there's no way that happened because of brain tap, but it happened because of skill level, but he was able to put those two together. And it was just a convergence of great opportunities and made a big step. So I hope to be on Joe Rogan and I'll let you know when I get on, you can, you can watch it. Well, I brain mean, tap was, so you were, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. no, that's, a, that's awesome. Be nice to work, uh, you know, get a break, do brain tap, uh, get a map. I mean, boxers, oh my goodness, they should, should let the swelling get down. They should do one after uh, every fight. I don't Believe think they want to do that. But with uh, McGregor, the guy that beat him was a brain tap user. He's been right? using brain tap. So, oh, no I mean, kidding. we have a lot of the, the, the top 10 MMA F UFC fighters. They use our device because it's we did it. We're doing a study right now with the U.S. Olympic uh, snowboarders. And what we're showing is that when you use this therapy, you actually become neuroprotective. So, you know, these people that are doing these sports like snowboarding, where they're just, you're going to fall down all the time when you're snowboarding, you need to protect your neurology. So, and Skip, you've got another question. So let's go. Yeah, to I do. Um, and, you know, Joe Rogan had a big impact on your show. Wait till this airs. You get at least, yes. you know, three, four calls by next week, right? <laughs> at least, at least. You mentioned evoke potential and, and this idea of healing potential. And I was hoping you'd be able to talk to it. And, and just to kind of remind, if you don't know, like we have the, the gamut here, we have parents, you know, interested in, in helping their kids and then professionals too, that are, you know, doing these things and, and uh, the technicians that are you know, doing neurofeedback all listen. So can you talk about red light therapies or far and near infrared light treatment and how that plays a part in this, this healing of potential? or anything else that, that you guys are aware of that heals the potential. It seems like the linchpin here. Sure. Yeah. Well, one thing is the old story about keeping people in the dark, that's totally been debunked. The, you need to start using your brain as much as you can without stressing yourself out too much. They, they know that now with, with research, but you have to, you have to give it something. Uh, the your brain only detoxes during sleep. So if you don't get level four sleep, then you don't open up the, in, in 2016, American Scientific came out with a, re, a whole thing saying that they discovered the lymphatic system of the brain. They call it the glial lymphomic system, but it's always been there, right? But if you look at an, uh, anal uh, anatomy book, books from before 2016, it wasn't there. Now it is. 
So, but they know the reason they didn't find it is you, it only reveals itself during sleep. During, so 60% of the detoxing of the brain, they said 100%, but I've seen other studies that showed 60% only happens while you sleep. So that means there's a lot of toxins there. So the first thing from a brain injury standpoint, and by the way, every one of us and everyone listening probably has fallen down at least 2000 times, if not more. Uh, I was very uncoordinated, so it was probably more for me. But so when you were born, you you have this, let's say, perfect brain, and then you go through the birth canal. That's your first traumatic brain injury. And then then you when and you need that because you need to challenge the brain, you need to teach the suture points, you need to break those open because the brain has to breathe. Okay. The spinal fluid has to come up. That's why breathing techniques are so good. But we have these plates in our head. And the skull is not solid. And hopefully everyone knows that there's suture points in there. So we can use infrared to get light into the brain. Light works because what it does is it hemoglobin absorbs the photons. And every cell of our body has something called chromoforms. And these chromoforms are actually like little batteries. They absorb energy in the form of light or vibration, which is sound. So light, sound, and vibration, our body absorbs that energy. And then it's taken to the part of the body that has, that's dying because our body's always dying and rebuilding and rebuild things like that. But our brain, it's hard to get that light into the brain because it's so protected, just like supplements and things like that. But with infrared light, we can, because they now know that the, these plates and the brain actually are opaque. So there is light that comes through. And, and I like to tell people my mission in life now, because I've already done a lot of other things, is to take, I do a lot of research with ancient traditions and showing how modern technology is just taking these ancient traditions and changing them. So just to give everybody a little history lesson here, the, the Vedas, which is over 10,000 years old, talks about something called helos therapy. And when people do yoga outside or they do Tai Chi outside in the morning, what the Vedas talked about is helos therapy is the sun. So we're going to use light therapy. They said, if you can get up between 3.30 in the morning and 6.30 in the morning, you can heal your brain. They talked about it 10,000 years ago. <laughs> now we know what we've done in science is we said, oh, let's go to the 810 to 833 nanometer light spectrum, which is infrared. We can heal the brain. That happens to be the most intense light during those hours of the day. We, we have light coming in from 3.30. So around... So that's what's happening. So if we want to heal the brain, that's what we have to do. Now we can also put it through the nasal. There are nasal lights that you can use. What I did was I wanted to put it in the ears. So when somebody sees the brain type, they go, why the hell do you have lights in the ears? Well, all the blood in your body circulates through the ears every three to five minutes. And the rest of your body takes 45 seconds. So if we can blood dope, we can all that blood sitting there with the hemoglobin, we can now put 47, 47 nanometer light of blue light and 633 nanometer red light. These can go in here. Now our helmet is 810. And so, you know, we're using that. So we're bringing light into the brain because the ear blood, it's filling with uh, the hemoglobin is now saturated with light or, or photaic energy. And that goes right into the brain. And the reason it does that is the brain is going to, it regulates its temperature through blood flow. So it gets that the blood goes through the ears first. So if it's warm outside and you need to cool down the brain, then it's not going to bring as much in. But if it's cool out here and the brain is hot, it's going to bring more. So it's part of the regulating system of the brain. But it's one of the best ways to bring blood that is oxygenated and has photaic energy into the, into the brain. So that's what we're using. And what we find is that the body can only, there, there are certain phases. We're fortunate here at BrainTap that I hired a guy that was the first one to ever publish photobiomodulation in the brain. His name is Francisco Cedral. I hired him as my science officer because I called him and I said, Francisco, I love this article about brain healing. Where can I buy this device? And he said, oh, we built it in the lab. I said, well, isn't there one? He says, no. I said, would you mind me building one? And I'll pay you a royalty every time we sell one. And we negotiated a deal. And I said, I'd really love you to come to work for me. Well, he also is the guy that wrote the chapter for Hamlin, who works, who's at Harvard, who wrote the book on photobiomodulation in the brain. That's our guy who wrote the chapter in his book. So what we did is we, we show that there's certain dosages. Some people just think, just put light on the brain. Well, that's okay, but your brain can only absorb so much. Once it absorbs, it's like a 20 minute dose. 
If you're using a laser, for instance, uh, you can do it in as little as three minutes, but we use low level light therapy, so it's unmanned. So a clinician like myself, I can be working with my client over here, maybe doing some neurofeedback. They can be over there doing their photobiomodulation without me even having to touch them. The staff can handle that. And so I can basically expand my practice without expanding my personal workload. So that's why we use the low level light therapy. And what we're seeing is we can show that across the board, like with the evoke potential, the P300, we can accelerate that healing like I was saying that Wabi showed it was 130% faster than without using it. And lasers, the problem with lasers, lasers are good. I, we use lasers all the time here. We put it at the base of the spine to get light into the brain because that's where the, that's the best place where all those nerve endings are back there to give it light. Uh, you'll see an overall change in the body. But if, you, if you're, that laser is hitting one of the plates instead of the suture points, it's not going to, there's not going to be as much penetration into the brain. So we have to have big coverage and we can't put a laser that's that big on somebody's head. So, so we use low level light therapy to do it. And what we find is that everybody responds to it, but there are some people if their nervous system is too overworked or what might be called an overtired nervous system, you can have an adverse effect. So they might only need a three minute dose, you know, instead of a 20 minute dose, you just have to monitor that and see what's happening. And, and by monitor, you mean check in with the patient, how you feel and how's this between sessions treating you? Also, we measure it. We can, we can measure photaic discharge across the brain uh, with our device. We can show the energy transference between the right and left hemisphere. So um, everything is vibrating, right? So we have this alive universe that we live in. And so what, the, what we did with the Russians who owned the patent on this equipment, uh, we hired them to give us some statistics from this, uh, we, we can send a signal through the body, a low level current signal with clips on the wrist. And we get the feedback once we have them do a task. We can see, here's what the baseline is, what is it afterwards? So with that, that potential, we can actually see, did their body down regulate? Like, did they uh, become more sympathetic? Which can happen. I mean, you think you're doing something really good for somebody, but the body has an adverse effect. And then, or is it having the positive? And we can also tell that through vagal tone, you know, so some test that way, but that's usually the way we do that. So in real time? Yeah, real time. Wow. Through kinesiology and things like that. So we can, we can check that out. Dr. Porter, uh, Dr. Porter, uh, we got to you through Dr. Sanderson. We didn't touch on that the relationship there she she's into dementia and uh ha has a great uh uh physical place uh for that how, how did you guys meet how what's the relationship well, there she started using she one of her mentors were using brain tap and then she invited her to use brain tap and then she has a i went and visited her and she i had her speak at one of my masterminds in in california uh, she has a unique situation there in, in California that uh, she has a home where people actually with dementia and Alzheimer's can actually come and live. But instead of just uh, basically surviving while they're there, she's getting these people back thriving. And it's not to be there for life. You know, like a lot of people, uh, this is one of my missions too, is people think that just because they get diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's, it's over. That's not true at all. Our brains can heal at any age, and we're going to prove that. We've already proved it with one of our studies where we showed a, this was, the, we did a pilot study that's now in a bigger study with Seminole College in Florida. But the pilot study showed a 49% neuroplastic change in six weeks. It showed the, what we call a um, reorganization skill, which means we stressed them out, <laughs> it's, saw how their brain responded and then how long did it take them to get back to their baseline we improved that by 58 percent in six weeks we we took people that their doctors had diagnosed them as dementia sent them back to other doctors that diagnosed them so they didn't have dementia and when they went back to their regular doctor with that diagnosis they said well of course if you came to me like this i wouldn't have i wouldn't have said you had dementia but the problem is in our medical world once you're marked you're marked the reality is that we have so much neuro training out there that we can, the problem is nobody knows about brain fitness. Nobody knows. They think, oh, I'm going to go to the gym and, and exercise is a good form of brain fitness, 
but you have to do brainwave training. If you don't do brainwave training, your brain will just keep dysregulating, dysregulating, and then it starts to think that it's normal. So what we're doing with, with her is we're, we're putting on the uh, Alzheimer's Recovery Summit, and we, we're going out, finding the doctors that have some, these are all without the medical model. We don't want pills. We don't want lasers. You know, I mean, lasers are okay, but I mean, I'm talking about cutting into people. We want to have natural. What can people do either with their clinician or what can they do at home? Because a lot of people think they, too many times people want a pill instead of a solution. I, we have a saying here, it's you either want a pill or you want responsibility. So you can't fix the brain with a pill. I wish we could, you know, there's a lot of good movies out there. You can take a pill and you become the super genius. Well, that's not going to happen because we talked about at the very beginning of the show, epigenetics is going to downplay that. You are who you are because of who you think you are in your training and your life experience. If you want to change your life, you got to change your life experiences. And we can't, you can't change the brain by reading books either. This is a physiological process. It's not a, yeah, you can't just, I've read five books. Why am I, why am I, why is my body going to hell? Well, you got to, you got to get your body. Our bodies are designed to move and breathe. In fact, what I tell people when they come through my training, it never ends. You, you can't end brain training. So you either have to do Tai Chi, yoga, or dance. And uh, if you've ever scanned people who are any of those three that are really good at it, you will see a brain that is incredible. Because the brain, if they're, if they're really good, like a professional dancer, or they're a Tai Chi master, or they're a yoga master, They've already balanced the brain. They're working those brain waves. They don't know they're doing that. Those are the only kind of exercises. But so most of the population out there is so dysregulated. You can't just go do yoga. You can't just go do meditation. Like people go, I tried to meditate. I can't do it. Well, of course you can't. You're so neurotic. Your, your brains are, are a constant battle. You're in a struggle between the two hemispheres for dominance over this anxiety and fear and frustration. If you're going to slow down, you've got to first balance the brain. That's the first thing I tell everybody. Even we, we sponsor Dave Asprey's uh, biohacking summit. And the first thing I tell them is, I don't care what other thing you do. If your brain's out of balance, you're going to have the most expensive urine in the world. Because if you're in, if you're in sympathetic overload, you're going to just eliminate it out. So work on your brain first. Then everything else follows. You can't work on the, I mean, some people will, there are always those outliers. You know, we all know somebody who was very depressed and anxious. They went and started physically working out and they got their brain around. We actually started as a family because my mother went to an iridologist, which is they can look at your eyeball, believe it or not. They can tell you what's wrong with your body, which is pretty incredible. But my, what really, what it helped my mother find out was sugar is bad, white flour is bad, dyes are bad, and took us all off of those. And we became, instead of becoming troubled kids, we became geniuses. Everybody thought, wow, the porters are all real smart. No, we eat really well, you know, and we exercise, you know, that's what, but before we were getting up in the morning, eating fruit loops and becoming psychotic, you know, and nobody knew it was because the, the, the biggest toxin on the planet right now is white sugar. So, you know, a lot of people just to fix their anxiety could just get rid of sugar. They probably fix it, you know, 40% of the time or more. So that's, that's kind of where we're at with it. <clears throat> I'm going to throw um, rock climbing onto your list of uh, uh, physical exercise to improve brain functioning. Uh, I'm going to quote Len Koziel again, our mentor. He comes up a lot in the show. Um, but he um, brought to our attention that uh, if you're trying to improve working memory, which is kind of, kind of uh, we, what we used to re refer to as short-term memory. So working memory is um, kind of that sketch pad in your head when you're anticipating doing something, you're kind of noting, so to speak, uh, the steps of what you're going to do. So you're anticipating your action and, and planning it so, before you do it. So we need working memory for that. It, it holds all the information and the uh, things we're going to do before we do it. So it's a, an immediate memory kind of thing. Anyway, that is a, a symptom that um, uh, is pretty prominent in those with dementia. And so Len would, uh, he passed his article around that the thing that there's not much that can help working memory. And he, um, you know, gave, gave some statistics about some of these puzzles and Sudoku and crossword puzzles and things. And, and there's other kind of electronic apps and, and things you can get luminosity, I think he quoted. But there's no research to support that really anything, uh, there's something called COGMED, C-O-G-M-E-D, 
and it's uh, something that a um, psychologist can administer. It's computerized, can improve working memory, but while you're using it. So it's kind of like medicine that you, you only uh, get benefit in, in the time that you're using it. But where I'm going is that he did find, he dug into the research and he found uh, one article that said you can improve working memory in folks with dementia by rock climbing. And so I'm, you know, first thing I do is a, a, my brain pops to a bunch of elderly folks uh, climbing uh, a mountain or doing, you know, some of those uh, climbing exercises and those, um, uh, you know, the gyms or whatever. And then I started laughing because I, I can't imagine, and I can't put those, those two things together. So I, I don't know who ran that research or whatever, but it's supposed to be effective. And the point was that uh, if, if you're physically planning, then that can translate to cognitively planning. Um, and we deal a lot with that with our, our kids that we test, you know, we're neuropsychologists, we, we see a lot of kids. And um, we know that our cognitive development's rooted in the, the motor development and vice versa, I guess, when you get to dementia. So where I'm going is to a question here. So I don't know how you get, you know, someone in their 80s to rock climb if they have dementia. I know I was kind of talking to uh, Dr. Sanderson about that, you know, um, she has a, sounds like a wonderful facility and, you know, asking folks to change their diet and, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, we're asking them to rock climb or something like this. Um, yeah, well, we have some, we have some exercises. We, what we do, uh, we never had them rock climb. I think that might be interesting. You'd have to be really careful. The, but the, uh, what we do is, the, you know who Feldenkrais is? Have you ever read any of his books? The, uh, you know, the cross crawl and things like that, that kind of mimics that. So um, that's why like Tai Chi, anything that has them having to do a movement and think at the same time, you think that's what you're finding out like yoga or like I'm talking about. So that's really good. But you can also have them do like planks. One of the things we found with dementia patients, we haven't, before we start the training, we, we figure out, can they do a plank or not? Those are pretty hard, right? So usually they can't, but by the end of six weeks, they're doing a plank for more than a minute you know, because that's, that takes a lot of thinking. And we also did a study where we showed uh, the, the distributor system that is, um, everybody think has to do with exercise. It has more to do with brain function it, because that SMR brain wave, you know, the one between beta and alpha, that has a lot to do with your balance in your distributor. When that's off in, so what we find as we age, or what I like to tell people as we get better looking and more intelligent with age, what, what happens is, is that that's the brainwave that seems to atrophy first. You know, in what we find, just to give you an idea, we, we found also in our studies that if you don't have enough theta, you become autistic. All the characteristics of autism. If you don't have theta, you don't sleep. You know, so, and they're all tied to those 54 neurotransmitters in some way or another, you know, because if you're not in those brainwave states, the gut doesn't get the instruction to make those neurotransmitters. So it, it just doesn't make them. And the bank account's empty. So then they become angry and upset because those are in, if you're in a high beta state, let's say uh, of anxiety or a threshold of pain, then your body's overproducing those stress hormones like cortisol and that, and you know, the body's just burning out. So when you can do something fun, but it's stressful, then that's when the body learns. We, we don't learn by doing things that are comfortable, right? We have to, so I think, if you could get them to rock climb, that would be something interesting. I mean, I can't really do, I tried to rock climb with my grandkids and I don't have a problem and it was still difficult for me. So I, I don't know, you know, and I'm pretty athletic, so I don't know how we get a regular patient out there doing it. <clears throat> Dr. Patrick, we only have a few minutes left and this is a, no way this question can be answered in a few minutes, but you've seen a lot of positive results in, in your work and your devices. Uh, can you forecast when uh, the insurance companies will start paying for this and, uh, you know, the mainstream uh, medicine uh, it takes this seriously? Well, we, there already are CPT codes for, for neurofeedback, um, but you only get a limited amount of them, right? Not enough to do the job, <laughs> but you, right. they do pay for some of it, you know, so, uh, the, but I think that that's what we're doing in Brazil right now. Because Brazil, we were going to do it here, but it would have been about a five hundred thousand dollars study. But Brazil government did because they, the way they pay their medical bills are a lot different than we do, right? Our insurance companies, for whatever reason, we know that we can help them to reduce their cost of of medical bills just by improving their brain function. But I don't. I think that personally, for me. Um, 
we're working on that every day, really. I mean, we have yeah. a whole company, a whole part of our company that's working on getting CPT codes that can get it done. We're finding that only the MDs typically, when they prescribe it, uh, get it mostly paid for. Other than that, the DOs and chiropractors, they don't ever get it paid for, you know, but the MDs will usually get it paid for. Well, specifically a QEEG, it's listed as their experimental. Is that right, Dr. Laura? Yeah. Yep, that's my, yep, that's my experience. Uh, and, and it depends. Well, we like, there's different uh, policies, et cetera. We're in Illinois, and uh, yeah, they, they, they pull the plug on us. We're about 50% getting cues reimbursed up here. Yeah. I don't know. We just have to get uh, more more great guys like Dr. Patrick and, and Sanderson together, and we got to get a coalition. And I don't know. It's going to a digital drug versus a physical drug, right? Well, like, you know? Yeah. Well, like in India right now, we're working with Ames Institute. And uh, they're using it and they're approving it out too. So we're going to have, we have a, cult, a cross-cultural study going on for the digital drug study. So they won't be able to say, oh, you just did it in Brazil. No, we're doing it in India too. And we're doing it at Duke uh, here, who's one of our partners. So we're going to have the evidence that shows it. And we have the technology now to do it. That's the incredible yeah. part. We have technology that actually can peek into this invisible world that nobody saw before. We need oh, a that's... digital digital boxing glove. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's called Nintendo Wii. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, well, Dr. Patrick, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, it was great. I'll be back anytime you want me. This is all uh, right. This is oh, all right. oh, you you're gonna get bugged, believe me. Uh, Dr. Sanderson s suggested that we bring you on. Do uh, you think you can help us get uh, Bruce on, or even Dave, Bruce Lifton, Dave Asbury? Oh yeah. Just uh, uh, what I can do is once send me the information you want me to share with them. Uh, we could have, I'm, I have a meeting next week with Joe Dispenza, so he might be. Oh yeah, that. yeah. I mean, uh, we, that'd be great. Joe's somebody Joe. we work with all the time, so we can tell him about yeah. it. And, no, absolutely. Yeah. We're you know we're just trying to get the word out. This is our you know stone throw in the ocean of trying to you know get more people to you know, to support what I can it. Do too is uh, because I teach at Quantum University, they have a lot of these. Uh, they have a course in neurofeedback there that it's one of the things I consult the students in that on. But Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Paul Druin, he could get you a lot of, you know, good people. Perfect. You know? Perfect. So I'll, I'll connect you with those. Oh, we'll, connect, we'll connect after the show. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll get you some names of some, some people. Maybe you might even want to, uh, like Dr. Kelly Miller wrote the book, Saving Your Brain. He's yeah. the one who did that study I was quoting. Um, He's a good one to interview. He's done, he's done a lot. He would be a good one. And then we have like Dr. Bagnell who has dolphin camp, does neurofeedback with dolphins. It's a cool, a cool thing. So I'll get you some names of some. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, let's make sure we get the plugs right. You got nine books. Uh, yeah. What's the best way? How can we direct people to, uh, to purchase so if they these? Learn more, they should go to braintap.info. And for free, they can download that book, Thrive and Overdrive, and they yeah. can try out our app for 15 days for free. So you don't oh, have to have a credit card or anything. Just if, if you like it, then you go back and buy it. If you don't, you had 15 days and you get to keep the book. So just try that out. That's probably the best. They can always yeah. look me up at, at DR Patrick Porter. You know, that's on all the social media channels or sure. at BrainTap Tech. You know, they can follow us there. And we'll, we'll put all the links at the, in, in the bottom of the show notes, uh, Dr. Patrick. Uh, this is what a great show. Uh, Dr. Laura, did you try any new beverages this week or is that something that's going to be next week? Well, I received in the mail a package from RS Coso. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, um, but it's a uh, gut healing uh, potion. And that's not fair to them, but that's what came to my mind. Um, and I haven't tried it yet. Came in some Okay, all right. Being, yep, and so I'll, I'll keep you posted for next time. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll ask next week. Yeah. Okay. All right, Dr. Patrick, thank you again for coming on the show. We, we thank everybody for listening to Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback, and Neuropsychology Podcast. The contact info for everyone is located on the podcast notes uh, below. If you have an idea for a topic, please email pete at neuronoodle.com or leave us a voicemail with the link on the podcast notes. Please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, smash that like button on Facebook, Instagram, and follow us on Twitter. 
And hey, if you really, really, really like us, buy us a cup of coffee on Patreon. Slash Neuro Noodle. Cue the music. Dr. Patrick.